Hi there, welcome back to our service and guess what? We are just kind of like a week away from Resurrection Sunday and just so glad that you have been with us even for this year in all our services and I hope that you have been blessed and encouraged and even as you have received, well, use the opportunity to even invite others to join us together to come and focus upon God, to pray and worship God and also to meditate upon God's truth together. For our time of prayer together, we're going to look at a couple of verses in Psalms 139 to guide our time of prayer. It says here in 139 verse 13, For you form my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Now the psalmist says this, that God is the one that formed us and formed our inward parts, which means everything on the inside of us, our internal organs, our hearts, our lungs, our kidneys and all of that, God is the one who formed that. And right now, you're listening to this, maybe you have a concern with something on the inside. Maybe there's a health concern. Well, God is the greatest physician because He is the designer. He formed it. He knows exactly how that functions and He knows how to rectify it or to bring healing even over your body. And so continue just to believe in God's healing over you because He is that designer. Verse 14 is this, says this, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Do you believe that? That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, another translation actually says this, that we, it is, we are wonderfully complex or mysteriously complex. All right, for some of you, you are still trying to figure yourself out. Well, don't get too discouraged because we are wonderfully complex. We are wonderfully made. And do you know it well? Now, don't use this as a uh, a cop-out, as a reason to have bad behavior, bad attitude, or to, to do wrong things. But simply this, God is telling us here, even from this verse, that we are wonderfully made. And it's actually very complex. There's a lot of things that's going on inside. And even as we journey with God, discover that. But it begins with simply praying that my soul knows it well that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 15 says this, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. My frame. God has given us a frame. A physical body is a frame. A frame means something that's solid, something that is firm, something that cannot be shaken. Right? Is, is there sh- something shaking you right now? Well, God has given you a frame Right, that you will not be moved, you will not be shaken if you put your faith, your trust upon Him. Verse 16, Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. This is a powerful verse, which means every day in our lives, well, God has written them already. What's happening today, right now, that's going to happen later, God has already written that what's going to take place in his book, which means God has a destiny, a purpose for your life, for my life. And that's where if we understand this, when we pray this verse, we can celebrate every day in all of his fullness because it is determined by God. Two more verses. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than sand. Pause for a moment. Look at the truth from this verse that the thoughts that God has for you and for me, we cannot even count it. So vast is His thoughts for us. His, 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 His thinking of us all the time that we cannot count them. Isn't that encouraging? Well, pray through this, that God loves us so deeply. And then it ends off with saying that I awake and I'm still with you. That promise that God never leaves us nor forsake us. And so Father, we pray even as we begin our service, that thank you that you are the f- you are the one that form our inward parts. That even right now, if there's any one of us who's watching that needs a healing touch from you, that needs your 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 the designer coming in within us to rectify something within our body. Lord, we pray even right now in agreement for healing to take place, the power of your spirit to work in our inward parts. Let healing come in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you that God, that your promise is true, that you're with us all the time, 
that you're always thinking about us. Your thoughts for us is so vast that we cannot even count them. And so Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love over our lives, Lord. Even as we come before and we worship you today, let us worship you with joy in our spirit, joy in our hearts, knowing that you are for us and you are with us always in Jesus' name. Amen. Write your name deep in my heart Seal my soul full of your love And your peace over my fears Etch in me all you The author of my life, I will sing you praise. You're the savior of my soul, I will shout your name, Jesus, Jesus. Write your Shout your name, Jesus, Jesus Author of my life, I will sing you praise You're the Savior of my soul I will shout your name, Jesus, Jesus we thank you that we have this opportunity to worship you to receive from you even in a manner like this it's virtual but your presence is with us we praise you we give you all the glory in Jesus name and just like to encourage us to continue to worship God with your tithe and with your offering if you'd like to do so you can get onto our website and you can uh, find the details over there well now we're going to hand over the time to Pastor Joey for a time of meditation upon the word of God Hello, everybody, and welcome to this segment on Meditating on the Word of God uh, for the month of April. And as you know, in 2022, we began with a series of messages entitled Abide, talking about the Word of God. In February, we dealt with the issue of sin, and in March last month, we talked about the author of sin. And as you know, if you've been tracking with us, we started a series on the way of the cross in light of the Lenten season and Holy Week. Last week, we talked about into the garden. We started by finding Jesus in a place called Gethsemane. When we talk about the Lenten season and the various places we find Jesus in, 
there are two centerpieces we will find. The first is the cross, and the second is the tomb. Today, I want to address the cross. I've entitled this message, Crossroads, the place where Jesus, we find Jesus in. And like last week, we looked at the place and the posture we find him in. And then finally for us, the things to remember about what happened in that place in the life of Jesus. Point number one is the place of the cross. To understand the place of the cross, the significance, the benefit, the power of the cross, we need to understand the power of sin against us. And that's why in February, we dealt with a series of messages on sin, starting with above the sin pandemic, talking about the reality of the trajectory of our lives with sin. And well, it ends up in a trajectory, it ends up with a beast that is ready to eat us up alive and destroy us. It talks about the heart, which is corrupted, and finally, a root system that is so dangerous that it destroys our lives completely. And now we all arrive at the place that the only real way to solve this problem of sin is through the cross. Nothing and no one but the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is reality is the only thing that can fix the trajectory, the beast, the heart, and uproot the rotten roots of accusation and condemnation. Today, we start with the place of the cross. It is the place where you find Jesus, place of suffering and pain. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, uh, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus suffered once for our sins. He suffered so that you and I will be freed from the consequences, the suffering, and the pain that sin will cause us. He suffered so you and I do not have pay for the penalties of sin, whether you are righteous or unrighteous. And the fact of the matter is there are some areas in your life and in mine that may be naturally not righteous to us, and there are certain areas in our life that are certainly unrighteous. In short, none of us are perfect, and we need a Savior, and only Jesus and His death on the cross can bring us rightfully back to God. His body was put to death in the body and made alive in the Spirit. This is the first place of the cross, the place of suffering and pain. And that's why we understand that it plays out in our lives and God designed it as such. The bottom line is life is like that. It is also the place of curses and shame. Curses play a real role in our lives. Only God has designed it. God designed it that way rather because the bottom line is curses are part of the universal design of God. He doesn't have to curse us. It is designed that way that if we do disobey Him, we end up not being blessed. Instead, we end up being cursed. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 says, See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. In short, He's giving you a choice. It's not that He's forcing you to be cursed. You're going to be cursed because you choose not to obey God and receive His blessing. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving to you today. He set this at the very core of the laws of God in truth of blessing and curses. It's not karma. It's not. It's a universal law that God ordained for justice. A way of saying sowing and reaping. The whole idea is that there is such a thing as a blessing and there's such a thing as a curse. And where do these curses come from? If you Cursed if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God. And turn from the way that I command you today. That's how we get cursed. Curses are real. In fact, curses are so real and more dangerous than a heat-seeking missile. It is more accurate, more precise, and never stops seeking after you. The same way that blessings do not stop seeking after you if you decide to obey God. This is where we get the idea of generational curses. Curses that are passed on generationally, and only Jesus can stop that. You may have heard of psychic readers and advisors and counselors who play around with people a lot in light of the bereaved people have lost their loved ones and kind of step as a medium to connect back to there. But the other big business of psychic readers is this idea of generational curses. But more often than not, they offer the solution by telling you to buy a certain rock, a certain stone, a certain material, a certain garb to prevent you from receiving your generational curses. In fact, the situation is so bad that in the United States, there is a growing problem regulating fortune tellers. There, there is now a need to regulate them because the scams are numerous, if not too many. 
But the truth of the matter is the only way a curse, a generational curse can be stopped is through the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 tells us, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law has been built with a curse system that if we disobey God, we end up being cursed. But the good news is Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone who is hung on a pole. And that's what Jesus did for you and me. He died for you. In the place of the cross, we find the place of suffering and pain. We also find the place of curses and shame. It wasn't just curses that Jesus received in the cross. It was shame. More than just uh, uh, the curses that hang over our heads, there's shame. And the internet, they never forget the issues that you and I have done, the past things that and all of us are guilty of some th sort of thing in our lifetime. And some of people may not forget it. But more than just the physical suffering and curses that prevent us from enjoying God's blessing, Jesus took away the shame and took all of it so that we will never have to be guilty of shame ever again. Think about the magnitude of that. But because of Jesus, you and I have been made free through the cross from pain and suffering, from guilt and shame, and from curses. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Why? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross because he scorned its shame. The word scorned is another word for despise, to have great hate, to intensely hate something. Jesus hates the fact that the devil wants to shame you and me and to condemn us and to accuse us. And thus he died on the cross and sat at the right hand of the Father victoriously, setting us back into this place, not of shame, but of grace. The place of the cross is the place of suffering and pain, and it's also the place of curses and shame. Interestingly, Jesus did all of that so that you and I may be freed from it. Finally, and what's interesting is, in the midst of suffering and pain, curses and shame, Jesus was silent. But the last part of the place of the cross is the place of separation from the Father. And in this moment, Jesus was no longer silent. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, he said this, About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's interesting that among all the things that Jesus suffered at the cross, this is the one that brought him the most pain. More than the physical suffering, more than the pain, more than the curses, and more than the shame and the guilt, this was the one that hurt him the most. I could imagine that while Jesus was on the cross, he was remembering times with his dad, the joy. He was remembering the love that he enjoyed with the Father. He was remembering the wisdom and the counsel, and he was remembering the fellowship, more importantly. My son David is in town right now, and I've had a moment to fellowship with him. And I understand very clearly the joy of standing in fellowship with a son. I have three sons. The joy of watching them become children, the joy of enjoying them. And I know that he enjoys the same thing because he likes spending time with me despite the fact that he has a very busy schedule. His mother kept taking pictures of us just chatting away. The feeling and the experience of both father and son is that moment of separation, particularly a father and a son who love each other. And this is the nature of Jesus. The sad part is we think that we can, we can get away from just hell. The reality of hell is not just the suffering and pain of hell. It's not that the shame and guilt for all of eternity. The worst part of hell is being isolated and separated from the Father. In Jesus, you and I have begun access. That's probably the greatest joy of my life in what Jesus did for me is that every single day I can have fellowship with the Father. But you might be saying, Pastor, I've seen people who are not suffering and don't seem to be cursed or in pain, and yet they don't seem to have any relation with God whatsoever. Or what you're seeing is common grace. The Bible tells us that God gives rain to the sinner and to the righteous. In other words, God blesses everyone in a common way. But make no mistake about it. When we're near death and we will all get there, the richest of us or the poorest of us, we will all die one day and we will begin to experience 
the full weight of what it means to have pain and suffering, guilt and shame and curses, as well as separation from the Father. First point, the place of the cross is the place of suffering and pain. It is the place of curses and shame. It is also the place of separation from the Father. But the second point is really the, the more important part, the, pur- the, pur- the posture at the cross. What was Jesus' posture when he was hanging the cross with all the suffering and the pain, with all the guilt and the shame, and with the separation from the Father? Where the first is, he focused on the joy. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, what we read earlier says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The joy set before him. You're probably wondering, how can somebody who's suffering that much pain having that so much joy? Well, the reason is because Jesus was celebrating, Father, I did it for you. There's nothing more joyful than when you start obeying God in the midst of a trial. I've been in that place so many times, not perfect, but in the times that I did, the joy of realizing that, Father, I may not have understood it at the moment, but because of your love for me, I choose to do your will. But the second reason why Jesus was joyful was, it is done. What he simply means by that is, I shall see them in heaven. These are the people that I've died for their sins for. And last Saturday, I baptized this man. His name is Manrique. And I had a chance to uh, be with his wife and children and explain to them what their father and her husband is about to do. He's about to publicly proclaim in the beach and to everybody, including them, what he was going to do and lay his life uh, and lay, lay down his life so that he could be buried in the waters of baptism. His older son, Antonio, asked me a question. Can I do the same thing? And I said, of course you can. When you believe in Jesus, when you understand what Jesus has done for you, that he joyfully died on the cross so that you and I can enjoy a life without suffering and pain for eternity, a life of freedom without curses and shame and guilt, and a life of enjoyment being associated, connected to the Father for all of eternity. The posture of the cross is not just focused on joy, but forgiving even in pain. Luke chapter 23, verse 34 says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Notice this. I can't imagine somebody who's hanging on the cross with all that pain and yet choosing to forgive for he realizes they know not what they're doing. And they divided his clothes and by casting lots, which simply means this. Jesus was not just hanging on the cross. He was not just... He was naked, full of the greatest, most embarrassing shame. A man who's helpless with all of that, and yet he stays there, hanging on the cross, abandoned, alone, ostracized, naked, and shamed. Not just that, the people who stood there watching and even the rulers mocked him. The pain and the suffering and, the, and, and, and knowing that you had the power to destroy everybody and yet chooses to forgive. They said to him, you've saved others, let him save himself if he's the God or Messiah, the chosen one. Verse 37 says, the soldiers also came and mocked him. To be mocked by everybody around you and to be isolated is one of the most painful things you can ever imagine. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And remember, Jesus forgave even before they mocked. Back in verse 34, it says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. The power of the posture of Jesus on the cross was he focused on the joy of finding, doing the will of the Father, finding and saving us from our sins, and forgiving even in pain. But Probably the final thing that was the posture of the cross, but not just the focus on joy or forgiving even in pain, but offering salvation. <laughs> it's powerful, isn't it? Somebody like this could only be the kind of God you want to serve. Luke chapter 23, verse 39 says, One of the criminals, not even just the soldiers or the people or the rulers, even the criminal who hung her, hurled insults at him and said, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Obviously, that was mockery. He was insulting him. But there was another criminal, and this one rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
Jesus responded, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is one of the most gripping parts of the death of Jesus Christ. This moment reminds us of three very important things. With Jesus, it's never too late. Doesn't matter how bad or how things have gone wrong, with Jesus, it's never too late. Secondly, prayers need not be long. <laughs> so many people pray long, winded prayers. This guy prayed the shortest prayer and immediately, and I want you to realize that, immediately when we pray from the deepest recesses of our hearts in sincerity to God, immediately God saves us. And then finally, it's not God who's really sends people to hell. It is people who send themselves to hell. God designed the universe for justice. He designed it where if you do what's right, you end up getting the blessing. If you do what's wrong, you end up getting cursed. In short, it is a choice, as the Bible says. And every time we choose God, we choose heaven. And every time we do not choose God, we end up choosing hell. The posture of the cross is focused on joy in the midst of suffering. The, po the, 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 the posture of the cross is forgiving even in pain in the midst of being forsaken and being separated and being alone. It is the place of salvation in the, in the place of people who are hopeless. Point number three is remember Jesus. Identify with him in the cross. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 says, Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me before others, will also acknowledge, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Acknowledging Jesus is standing before people and saying, I'm a believer in Jesus. That is actually what my friend Manrique did. And he says, when we do that, he will also acknowledge us before our Father in heaven. Verse 33 says, but whoever disowns me before others, I will also disown before my Father in heaven. What does it mean to acknowledge Jesus? What does it mean to identify with him? For well, he is a trustworthy saying. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we died with him and acknowledge that our life is based on Jesus' life alone, and we choose to die to our sins and live in Christ, we will find ourselves acknowledging him. And if we don't, he will also disown us. What does it really mean to acknowledge Jesus? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25 says, In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Notice the words, do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, the crucifixion of Jesus until he comes. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. This is what it means to remember Jesus, identifying with Jesus on the cross. Secondly, stop trying to save yourself. You can't stop the suffering and the pain that will come in our lives. You can't stop the curses and the guilt and the shame because you and I, we will make mistakes. And you certainly cannot find yourself back into the Garden of Eden in the presence of the Father without Jesus. Only Jesus can save us. So stop trying to save yourself. Instead, remember Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. He was crucified. Don't be foolish. Don't try to start this and make this happen on your own. I would, like to learn you, I would like to learn just one thing from you, Paul asked. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you foolish? There it is. Are you beginning after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by the means of the flesh? There is no way you and I can save ourselves. Only by remembering Jesus, what he did on the cross, and identifying with his death and resurrection, Stop trying to save ourselves. And finally, to remember, Jesus restores us back. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says this. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus is not condemning you. No one. Jesus who died more than that, who, raised, who was raised to life, 
is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Verse 36 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Here's the point. Verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor any curse, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus. When we remember Jesus, we remember identifying Him with Him on the cross. Stop trying to save ourselves that He has restored us back to the Father. Let me summarize. Point number one, the place of the cross, the place of suffering and pain, the place of curses and shame, the place of separation from the Father. Point number two, the posture of the cross. There we find Jesus focused on the joy despite the pain, despite the suffering, despite the curses and shame, despite the separation from the Father. He focused forgiving even in pain. And more importantly, he offered salvation. The key to us is to remember Jesus, that in him we have been saved if we identify with him on the cross. Stop trying to save ourselves and make sure to remember that Jesus restores us back into fellowship with the Father. As I close, I want you to take a piece of bread and a cup and join me in this brief word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we honor you, praise you, and thank you for dying on the cross for us, for being willing to suffer, be ostracized, humiliated, and be separated from the Father so that our sins will be forgiven and we can have access to Him. This day and every day, we remember all that you have done and refuse to diminish your great sacrifice for us by trying to save ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. by us all in silence bore the cross who knew this man of sorrows would make our hearts
Lord Jesus, we remember you. We remember you and we give you thanks for going to the cross. We thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for our lives so that we can be redeemed, transformed and set free. And so Lord, we praise you. We just want to give you all the glory, Lord. You are the one, you and you alone deserve all our praise, all our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Have a great week ahead and join us once again next week for our service that's going to be on Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. Lift you high, you are high.